Hello, I'm John Rhys Davies. You may remember me from such films as Sliders, Quest for Glory 4, The Shadows of Darkness, and Herbie Goes to Gitmo. Tonight, we have a very special presentation in reading. H vs. P, The Firstly, by Tom and Daniel. In the year of our Lord 2012, Anna Domini, a race of evil beings we call the Equestrians came to our Earth through a trans-dimensional portal of unknown principle. They brought with them plagues of war and chaos, and their armies overthrew the collective human race. Civilians were enslaved by the Equestrians' slothful purpose, and the soldiers were mocked with mercy. The mercy of being devoured, often still alive and gagging on the taste of their own entrails. Humans scarcely stand as but a small population of survivors, a feeble resistance born of hopeless hope and led by the Williams family, who carry about them the last understood remnants of equality and peace in a conquered world. To think Two years beforehand, it was a ludicrous notion to believe in such a preposterous war that seemed more akin to the idle workings of a madman's mind. Today, our vision is blighted with the sight of diminutive equine creatures, positing a comprehension to mimic our own, all whilst prancing about as colorful demons on four stump-like appendages, and reaching barely the height of our abdomens. Their faces are etched inflated caricatures of our own by a person who had never seen our species before. Their eyes are gaping white voids of all too shiny irises and pupils. If you've ever stared long and hard at a cat's eye, you may start to wonder how it is the animal knows to look you dead on for attention. When an equestrian pony looks at you, you can't help but doubt it possesses the same kind of knowledge. Its glassy ocular organs resemble a homunculus's pretense, or a butterfly's wings, if the wings have a face to ward off predators. The same kind of knowledge, like they come from a plane of existence where knowledge itself is constructed differently, and the way they look is entirely off. It's not so much xenophobia as much as they fundamentally do not look like anything from our world. If they'd had eldritch tendrils of non-Euclidean geometry, they'd be positively downright Lovecraftian. You just look at them and your mind tells you they're wrong from the very way they register visually in your head. These alien beings are like nothing that exists in our world. We have horses and ponies of our world, Common animals domesticated as beasts of burden we've used since time immemorial. These extra-dimensional invaders are something else. Piggish and stout, speaking and colorful. Truly, they are evolved from a yoke separate from the nature that must be constant in our universe. James Williams stood on the front line and stared at the menacing pony army. Amongst his legions were three thousand men as well as his loyal companion, John Horridge. James took a deep breath to muster his body's emotional reserves, but he only filled his nostrils with the ripe stench of burning blood and gunpowder. James surveyed his environs to see the building piles of dead bodies, fed ponies and men, burning in a senseless yet sensory scape of surrealist horror. John approached. Sir, the ponies are bringing in reinforcements. We should think about retreating. John had to shout over the cacophony of explosions and staccato gunfire. James looked at his good friend. He shook his head, his lips set, in a taut frown of a man resigned to his fate, and the fate of three thousand fighting lives. We can't retreat when victory is so close. Sir... With all due respect, I have a daughter back home, and I really wouldn't mind being able to see her again, John said. Fine, go then, but I'll stay here and fight. James's ferocity at John's cowardice was intent, 
but their friendship was the only excuse for his tolerance. But sir, it's suicide! John's face sagged in anguish as he faced the futility of evincing any instinct of self-preservation his friend might have. Well then, at least I'll die for a good cause. His attention settled upon his remaining soldiers. Hearing John's alternative only further fused his ultimate decision like so much sediment. Hadn't it always been that way between them? He'd lifted his Russian submachine gun, a PPSH, to his shoulders as if he needed something real, something solid to add to the weight they carried. For the Union, roared James, not on a moment before he turned and ran towards the enemy. Dutiful soldiers followed close behind him like one seething mass of suicidal life, rising and rushing out from their trenches and foxholes in a uniform stampede. The men let out sporadic bursts of fire, striking a couple of ponies in the first trench. Swept up in the ordeal of bloodshed, James jumped into the first enemy trench his mind could single out. He shot the remaining ponies and reloaded his weapon. When someone jumped into the trench to join him, he did not need to raise his weapon. He knew it would be John. What are you doing here? asked James. They both had to crouch low because pony, pony trenches were built so much shorter than human ones. Someone's got to protect your sorry ass. A weak grin crossed John's face. James smiled despite his fatigue. He climbed out of the first trench and ran ahead toward the next, his heart pounding in his chest as hard as his boots slapped the mud below. Ponies laid down suppressive fire on him and his men. James let out a battle cry as he shut them down, as if in his mind it was his voice, screaming amidst the din of bullets in hellish confusion that knocked his enemies all down. It was the inner part of him. It was the soul of a soldier. John and James jumped into the penultimate trench. One more and they would have made it to enemy HQ, where invaluable intel had promised them the enemy commander, Rainbow Dash, resided. Far too invaluable. A promise, like the return of a prophet. We've nearly made it, John wanted to shout, but his own panting breath, which tasted to him of blood or sputum, was too heavy. In spite of his wheezing, his amazement was apparent. I knew we would. Come on, this is where it all ends. James was certain. His voice didn't sound like it, but he was certain. He slipped another drum barrel into his PPSH with all the tenacity of an office drone barreling through a week of Mondays. James jumped out of the bunker when a mortar careened into the blood-soaked mud behind him with a thunderous splat. The concurrent blast threw James up high, his arms spinning and legs flailing, and he landed with a sickening thud. James's ears were ringing, and a pain in his head urged him to answer a phone that wasn't there. His vision blurred and his left eye stung, as if a whole hive full of queen bees sought refuge in his skull. He took a moment to orientate himself. A moment or two. He begged fate for this, the, one way, the way one begs for five more minutes of sleep before school. Knowing he shouldn't, knowing that once he saw the consequences would become real, he turned his head to look back at the bunker. At first, he let out a sorry laugh, realizing he couldn't feel the left side of his mouth. The bunker was so far away, he must have been invincible to reach this far. John was not there beside him. John, where are you? James tried to bellow, but no voice came out. The wind had been knocked out of him. Still, he could hear his own scream, so loud in his head, that perhaps it was leaking out of him. Like a jinx, he thought to himself, John was not invincible. James crawled commando-style to the final trench. He slid himself in like a thief in the night, like a puppet with a broken string that had to be let down gently, and immediately he looked about himself. That was the moment when he could no longer feel what was real, the moment when he saw the grisly scene betrayed before him. He'd seen so many scenes like it, an infinite plenitude of dying men whose prone bodies had been shaking and beating like a frog dissected while it was still alive. His old friend lay there, now a half-blown-up corpse, his open eyes staring at him, 
like he'd just been shown a novel parlor trick. This was the face of the Grim Reaper himself, and it sucked out James's angered cry. He knew of no impulse to make such an inhuman noise. It had just been robbed of him, with all the force of an industrial strength vacuum. Still, the pulsating years of training moved him onwards. Disregarding any injuries he bore himself, he grabbed his dead friend's bolt-action rifle. For a moment, his hand shook, but he steadied himself by quoting an old movie. You'll put your eye out, he said to John. Deceased John. He stood up and almost toppled back over again. All that he could see was a Guernica-style vision of his men dying. Their ranks had thinned and they had scattered, disorganized. Prancing iridescent unicorns charged in, catching men on their horns like bottles in a game of ring toss. James stared down the barrels. One of the equine demons charged at him. He damned the heresy of all the losses he'd faced. He shrugged off the momentary confusion of staring down that oncoming horn rather than his own weapon sight. He fired and struck the galloping thing in the head. It continued to gallop. It didn't look like it'd stop. He cocked his gun again, and just then the pony swerved and collapsed sideways onto the filth. The demons came in, closer and closer. James fired three times, cocking after every shot. His efforts would prove fruitless. The damnedest devil of them all, the enemy monarch, one twilight sparkle, swept through the crowd of ponies as if the angel of death herself were pursuing some romantic, gliding, twosome dance with him. She walked on her two back legs. Her forelegs had been mutated into human arms. On her back she carried a double-bladed cane, its twin sabers jutting from opposite ends and decorated in her own cheerful visage. The blades themselves had been carved out of unicorn horns, as if the equestrians had no moral twinge about cannibalizing their own. James soon realized he was the only able body left. He was the last. Out of three thousand and two, he was one single remainder. Somehow the threat of his own impending demise didn't make him feel like anything was worth it. He didn't feel like a hero in that instant. He felt like just another man trying to get a job done. He shook these notions off. He aimed at twilight and fired. His ears went deaf as his finger tugged back on the trigger. But he wasn't actually going deaf. There was no noise, because the gun was empty. Twilight pitied him, and proceeded forwards. James threw the weapon to the ground with all the air of a childish temper, and pulled the machete off his back. Reacting almost instantaneously, Twilight pulled out her staff. This one is mine, she roared as she jumped into the trench. The roar was a kind of laugh, like a deranged pit fighter who had finally found some worthy opponent. Someone who might tilt the odds against her favor. She probably didn't think that way, of course. James was as ready as he'd ever be. Give up, human. It's no use. You've had your chance. Now make your time, said Twilight. I will never give in. James's voice was a bloody exhalation, intermittent but forceful with determination. When Twilight did not immediately retort, he lunged forward. As he propelled himself through the air, he felt as if he was soaring. His arm whirled his machete above his head in a wild, preposterous arc and swung it down. Twilight blocked with the right end blade of the staff and pushed the flat, si flat side of the left blade into James's head. The flat side was not sharp enough to pierce skin, but hard enough to disorientate James for a moment. The blades, the edges left reddened marks that could not be easily distinguished amidst the dirt and blood that caked his skin. James shook his head, stumbling to avoid toppling over and engaged his opponent once more. These little moments left him open, but she did not use them to strike. She was mocking him. He should have been better than this. He was better trained. Fatigue was for lesser life forms. Twilight smiled and James lunged for her again. This time she dodged out of the way with a smooth sidestep and sliced the back of James's left leg open. 
Dark red blood flowered into the air, as if someone had overturned a glass of milk. James cried out in pain and fell to one knee. His other leg shook so much with a pain he hadn't known was there until he fell to the ground outright. Twilight kicked away James's machete and placed one blade of a cane to his undulating throat. Give up and become one of us, she said. James laughed. Fuck you. The words were too much to form and he choked on something in his esophagus that tasted foul. He hoped it wasn't his trachea. Twilight's sardonic grin contorted into a malformed, menacing face of bestial rage, a face James had only seen in creepy images posted by the lonely to the internet. No, she said with a dramatic flare. Fuck you! With one swift motion, she slit James's throat, she watched him bleed to death of all the manner of someone reveling in the recording of a snuff film. After a nod from their esteemed leader, the ponies began to devour the bodies of the resistance. They gorged and fiddled themselves like a feast of Caligula, complete with the historical inaccuracies of the vomitorium. The gleam of Twilight's insidious smile shone like a crooked moon as she heaved up a mass of James's charnel and bloody esophagus in the palm of her deformed hoof hand. With a twinkle in her eye to match a mother's tear, she raised the raw, quivering mass to her lips and began to consume with glee. <laughs>